How many of you believe that? Nothing but the blood, right? <laughs> Father, we love you. And Lord, we just thank you for the cross and the resurrection. Lord, we thank you that your blood was shed so that our sin would be forgiven. And Lord, we, we gather together corporately today to lift up your name. And your word promises that where you would be lifted up, you would draw all people unto yourself. And so, Lord, I pray uh, for that work. And Lord, I pray three very specific things for us this morning. I pray you give us eyes to see you for who you really are. I pray you give us ears to hear what it is you have to say to us. And Lord, I pray you open our hearts so that we would respond in obedience to your word. So Lord, we love you. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so the, the, the next two Sundays, the sermons are going to be connected. And in light of everything you've been hearing for quite a while now, right? Because uh, hopefully you've been listening and you don't pray for patience anymore. Why don't you pray for patience? Because you have it, right? So you already have it. It's a matter of utilizing the patience God has given us, right? Uh, it's kind of like, you know, uh, a knight or, or, or a warrior, you know, who's got a sword. And he just kind of carries it around and, and brags on how beautiful it is and how polished it is. And, you know, and at some point somebody says to the warrior, you don't have a sword so you'll look pretty. You have a sword because there's a battle. Thank you. I was waiting. <laughs> you can always count on Dave. <laughs> We're in a battle. Let, let me tell you. So the, the materialists of the world believe that only the material exists. <laughs> if, it does, if there's not matter, it doesn't exist. Now, they have a hard time explaining love and compassion and those kind of immaterial things. But as, as Christians, we definitely believe there's a material world. We live in it, but we believe there's an immaterial world. Right? And so we believe there is a spiritual battle. Now, whenever you talk about a spiritual battle, uh, some people get super charged about that. And some people just really don't believe it. They're uncomfortable with battle language. Uh, but the Bible says that there is a spiritual battle. The Bible says this, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So you can say there's no battle, but somebody's trying to kill you. Somebody's trying to do you in, right? And so, man, we are constantly susceptible to, to the influences of the prince of this world, okay? So what I want to do is keeping in the backdrop that God's given us everything we need, we've got to answer this really, really important question, and that is, what has he given us these things for? And so I want to kick off the sermon with a question that I want every one of you to answer, you know, in your own mind. And here, here's the question. What would you give your life to? What would you give your life to? You know, you can think of it in terms of, you know, what, what would you die for? And think about it in those kind of terms. But this is the truth. For every person in the room, believer or unbeliever, every one of us have already given our lives to something. We've already done it. We're wired for it, right? Because we're wired for worship. Does everybody understand that? We're wired for worship. Even And somebody could be sitting here saying, yeah, I'm not really wired for worship. I don't get into the music and all that stuff. No, we are all wired for We will worship something. Matter of fact, tonight in America is one of the greatest nights of worship in the whole year. I'm serious. You know how many billions of dollars will be spent tonight? You know why? Because we, because human beings are wired to worship and we are going to worship something. You don't have, it may not be Jesus, but we're going to worship something. Every one of us. So my question is, what would you give your life to? For the next two weeks, we're going to talk about this topic that you've heard. The sermon will be a little bit different. It won't be as much expository as it will be topical, but we are, we are going to look at two passages connected to it. But we're going to talk about missions. Because at the end of the day, the reason that God has given us everything that he's given us is because he means for us 
to use those things. That's his desire, right? He gives them to us so we will use them. So I love the story years and years ago. The, the great missionary, William Carey, uh, was with a group of pastors. They were all kind of friends. And William Carey's heart was really burdened for missions, right? Taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And he's sharing with his pastor friends because William Carey's assessment of his own ministry and the ministry of these other pastors is that it pretty much stayed within the walls of their church. That pretty much all they cared about was just those people that came to their church. Now, listen to me. That is not the heart of the gospel. It is most churches, but that is not the heart of the gospel. God has given these things to us because he intends for us to use them. So William Carey, upon this evaluation of his own ministry, the ministry of his pastor friends, he, he, he gives a plea and he tells them, I'm going to go because we're supposed to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Say amen. We are supposed to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And William Carey says it this way. I love it. It's one of the most powerful historical things I've read. He says to John Ryland. He says, I will go down into the mine. If you will hold the rope. I love that. Because when it comes to missions. It takes two kinds of people. There, now, let me give a caveat. There are three kinds, but it takes two. Let me tell you, it takes people who will go down into the mine. What's William Carey mean when he says that? That there's got to be a bunch of people who will get out of their chairs and go. And let me tell you, and when I say that, I'm not talking about the gray chairs here. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about my recliner. Somebody asked me the other day, uh, if I wanted to go to Mexico to some resort for a vacation, and I said, why would I? My chair's in Bowling Green. My chair's not in Mexico or Hawaii or wherever. My chair's here. You know where I want to be? Where my chair is. <laughs> and it's here, right? So, so this idea that we would go, because for missions to take place, you got to have people who will go into the mine, people who will do the work. Pastor Wayne, I know I just saw him. Yes, Pastor Wayne. Man, that's what he does every day. He's going. He's in different schools. He's, with, he's meeting with the, the, the baptisms. Beautiful, right? And, the, and let me tell you something. If you're here and you give faithfully, you know what you're doing for Wayne? You're holding the rope. But you got to have people that will go. That's important. And there's no exemption clause from going. There are seasons where you hold the rope and there are seasons when you go. I want you to think about it. So it takes people who are willing to go. And they are hard to find. They are so hard to find. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. But you got to have people who will go. And let me just tell you this, because I want to be clear. If you're here and you're a believer, you are called to go. Maybe not India. We go to India every year. Maybe not India. I have no desire to go to India. I saw Indiana Jones. We go to Guatemala. We go to Honduras. We go to Costa Rica. Uh, we go down to the Salvation Army. Uh, we go out into the neighborhoods. I mean, there, trust me. There's no shortage of places to go, all right? And if you're a believer, you're called to go. It takes people who are willing to go. But it takes people who are willing to hold the rope, right? And that doesn't just mean giving, right? Uh, a, a, a lady came to me. She was in a wheelchair, extreme um, physical limitations. And, and she said, I don't know. She goes, I know I can't go. She goes, but I don't think I can even hold a rope. And it made me think I did a horrible job of explaining holding the rope. Because holding the rope is important. William Carey knew that he had to have the prayers of John Ryland and, and those other pastors. You know, and I told that lady, I said, oh my gosh, you can pray. And that is holding a rope. Right? But I don't mean when you're eating your supper, you pray. I'm talking about prayer. And you know, 
I think most people don't even really know what prayer is. For, for a lot of my life, prayer is just 911. I go to God because the junk's hit the fan. Anybody else? That's when I remember to pray. Oh my gosh, my life's falling apart. Jesus, does anybody else pray like that? That's me. But man, I'm talking about if you're going to hold the rope by prayer, you know what you do? I mean, it's an intentional thing that you, that you do. I mean, y'all got to meet Pastor Warner a couple weeks ago from Costa Rica. Man, I love it. Now you got a face with that name. And now when you pray, when you hold the rope for Costa Rica, man, you, you, you have those faces in your mind. It, it's powerful. We got to have people who will go. We got to have people who will hold the rope. But unfortunately, there's a third, and that's people who, I, and you all can help me. It's people who either don't care which is awful, or they don't believe, which is worse. I don't think there's such a thing, because somebody might say, hey, wait a minute, but a lot of us are really busy. Welcome to the planet. You know, we always struggle in student ministry. Everybody's like, man, these kids, they're busier than kids have ever been. No, they're not. They're, they're the same kids from the 1950s. You give them an hour with nothing to do, and they'll figure out something to do. And the problem is, all of us keep that mentality, so the reason we're so busy is because we've chosen to fill every, every hour of our day with something. And if you're not sure about the first question I ask, what would you give your life to, look at your calendar and look at your bank account, because you've already given your life to something, and that'll give you a clue of what it might have been. Now, guys, here's the thing. I have fire and passion for this. Let me tell you why. Because I believe this life is all about Jesus. I don't think it's about us. I don't think it's about our achievements, our accomplishments. It's not what we're going to leave behind. I had to meet with my kids to talk about what they're going to get when I die. Sam's getting a visa bill. Will's getting a MasterCard bill. <laughs> you know. But I'm going to split it all up evenly because I want them all to have something that was mine. Right? <laughs> But I don't believe that's what this life is about. This life is about Jesus, right? Number one, Jesus finds you. Say amen. Because Jesus found me. I wasn't looking for him. Matter of fact, I had a whole life kind of planned out, and it was going to be fun. Anybody have a fun life planned out? But Jesus found me. And when he found me, my plans didn't measure up with his and thus begin a great spiritual battle in my life. Would I submit myself to the plans that he has? Or would I just do what I want to do? And that book is not finished yet. Because it's still a battle. It's still a struggle. I can't tell you how much more I prefer to do what I want to do. And it's a constant battle, right? Why? Because the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Because it's funny. I won't tell you all the things I want to do. I, I'm not saying I'm doing them. But there's some things I want to do that get me fired. From here. Gosh, you ought to see how you are looking at me right now. <laughs> Lord, the judgment in this room. <laughs> I'm just being honest, right? But I did say I'm not doing them. But man, I'd like to. Reminds me of the old preacher who said sin's not fun, and I thought he's doing the wrong ones, <laughs> right? <laughs> but we got to have people who will go, who are willing to do the work. And the reason I have fire and passion about this, because at the end of our lives, when we stand before Jesus, man, nothing's going to matter here except what was about him. I mean, that's it. There's nothing else, right? You ever play a game and not know the rules, and you get to the end of the game, and you totally lose because you didn't know what the rules were? That's what Christianity is going to be for a lot of people. Because you're going to be, some of you are going to be amazed when you get to the gate. I don't know if there's a gate, right? I'm just using <laughs> the metaphorical language. And, you know, and you always hear that St. Peter's going to be at the gate. I don't know where they get that, but let's say that he is. He's not going to say, how many Bible studies you go to? How many worship services were you a part of? How many verses did you have memorized? How many people did you help? But th those aren't going to be the deal. Do you know why? And first of all, let me say, 
I hope you go to a lot of Bible studies. Say amen. <laughs> During the Bible study hour, everybody's looking at you like, hmm, hmm, Bible, Bible study? I hope you go to a lot. I hope you have a lot of verses memorized. I hope you know a lot of songs uh, by heart. I hope you go to a lot of worship services. All that's good unless you do it so you can get to heaven. Everybody hear me? And then, did you know what all that counts for? Nothing. Nothing. Because Jesus just loves you. And I know that blows some of you away, and it should. Look at you, right? I mean, that should blow all of us away. Jesus just loves us. And then you come to this great theological understanding that really really punishes the self-esteem culture that we live in when you come to understand that Jesus loves you based on his character, not on yours. You know what that means? His love for you never changes because it's based on his character. Ooh, that's exciting, right? So I, I want to tell you three things about missions, all right? Here's the first one. The heartbeat of God is that people everywhere would worship him. Now, I tried to change that sentence around a little bit because it could leave somebody saying, well, man, God sure is egotistical. He, he desires everybody to worship him. I mean, what's that sound like? But here's the thing. Nobody wants or has more for you than Jesus. Nobody. So your worship of him, it doesn't make him greater I really want you to help me with this, right? It doesn't make him greater because I worship him. If my worship of Jesus made him greater, he's not God. I am. He's great on his own. Without, He was great before I was ever born. He was great before I was ever saved, right? But his desire is that people would worship him because he has and wants more for any of us than anybody else does, even what we want for ourselves. And not just that. It's not lip service from Jesus. He gives those things. This world says, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Jesus said, I've already died for you. I've already done what I told you I was going to do, right? And it's about trusting him. So, so why missions? The heartbeat of God is that people everywhere would worship him. John Piper and... Uh, I hope someday we'll have some required reading for missions around here. We don't as of yet. So let me tell you about a great book that y'all need to get and you need to read if you really want to understand missions. And let me be specific. The biblical basis for missions. And John Piper wrote a book called Let the Nations Be Glad. And you know what he said? It blew me away when I read it 20, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. That the reason missions exist... Is because worship doesn't. Think about that. Missions exist because worship doesn't. So we're to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And, and the hope is we take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And a place that's never heard the praise and worship of Jesus will begin to hear it. That's why missions exist, so that we share not just the love of Jesus like that love is an abstract, intangible thing. But we're actually sharing Jesus with them. Right? So God's desire, his heartbeat is that people everywhere would worship him. Um, Romans 15, 19. So I love it. I don't know if anybody ever has this experience. Because a lot of you in the room, you've been reading the Bible a long time. Raise your hand if you've been reading the Bible a long time. Right? And so have I. And I love it when I read the Bible and I learn something that I didn't know. I love that. Right? And, and sometimes it's punishment for you all because I share these things with you because I'm so excited about them. Well, this happened to me today. I got to church at 5 o'clock this morning, not because I'm an early bird, but just because I'm going to preach. And, oh, my gosh, I need a whole lot of prayer before I get up to preach. Right? And so I'm reading Romans 15, 9. I want you to hear this. And let me tell you, I never this never hit me before like this. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised. Who are the circumcised? At the 8 o'clock, several people raised their hand. Now, it's, they're talking about the Jewish people, <laughs> all right? I suddenly just had a thought that that might have been incredibly inappropriate to share. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I 
Why do I feel like we're in a sixth grade classroom right now? <laughs> Come on, people. <laughs> For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, the Jews, to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So think about it. You know, so we talked last week or two weeks ago that um, as believers, we're the chosen ones. Now, Wednesday night when I preached that, I told everybody, I don't know why there's so much controversy and division over that line that we're chosen by God. I don't know how anybody on the planet can say, it's bad to be chosen by God. Oh, it's good. It's really good to be chosen by God, right? And so we know the New Testament isn't new because the old one didn't work out. You may have new house plans. You had old house plans, but now you have new house plans. Well, you have new ones because the old ones didn't work out. The Bible's not that way. We didn't get to the end of Malachi, which is the last book in the Old Testament. We didn't get to the end of Malachi, and God said, I don't, I don't even know what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to do something different. You always wonder if God's in heaven, and every once in a while says, oh, me. You'll get it in a minute. <laughs> you see, there was an old covenant and the new covenant. Now listen to this. This is so powerful. You know what Jesus said? I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to what? Fulfill it. That's incredible. That's the new covenant that God always knew that he was going to do. Yes, he chose the Jews in the Old Testament. Why did he choose them? He chose them to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, here's what I read this morning that I had never realized before. This is amazing. Get ready. Are you ready? Are you, I'm not going to read it if you don't. You know. Here we go. After he says all that. Uh, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Now, let me ask you, is that a quote from the Old Testament or the New Testament? No. Old Testament. This whole Gentile thing, it wasn't new because of the New Testament. God always knew that this is what he was going to do. And let me tell you, at this time in the world, you got two people. You got Jews and... So that means most of us in the room, maybe not everybody, most of us in the room, what are we? We are Gentiles. So you know what that means? Even in the old covenant, God knew what he was going to do for us. Amen. Now listen, he doesn't stop there. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Old or New Testament. You know, this is going to be on the internet, people. Billions of people are going to be listening to this sermon tomorrow, hearing me asking these questions and nobody answering. Now, we'll edit this part out. <laughs> but I need you to get with it. All right. <laughs> Old Testament. And again, he keeps going. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. Old or New Testament? Very good. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles will hope. God always knew what he was going to do. And what I never really noticed in Romans 15 is that when he talks about the gospel going to the Gentiles, he quotes four Old Testament sources and that that's always what he had planned. And so let me ask you, here at the 9, this is our largest service, the 930. How many of you will go into the mine? How many of you will hold a rope? I mean, listen, what's a symbol just here in this service? You know how many Jesus had and changed the world? Anybody? <laughs> kind of 12. 12 with one really stabbing him right in the back, right? Or kissing him on the cheek, you know, how the betrayal went. Jesus changed the world. And here, man, right here, 
in this church alone, because let me tell you this, some of you, this might offend you a little bit, but if you're sitting in this room right now, you are among the wealthiest people in the world. And some of you are thinking, are you kidding me? I'm not. If we lined up the world from wealthiest to poorest, all of us, we'd be in the front of the line. We really would. Why do I say that? Is this a guilt? Are we going to have a special offering after this? No. Been a good idea if I'd have thought about it. <laughs> but you know why I say that? Because in this room, sit the resources, not just financial, but the resources of time and talent that right here from the 930, we could take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Right here. At the 9.30 service, y'all can make fun of the 8 and 11 and say, what are you doing? We're taking the gospel to the ends of the earth at 9.30. We could do it, right? And so I want you to know that God's heartbeat is at people everywhere. I'm coming back to that. That's why that seemed like an abrupt ending. I'm coming back to that. The heartbeat of God is that people everywhere would worship him. Number two, when people worship, they cannot help but to serve. So it's a powerful thing that we want people where the name of Jesus hasn't been mentioned to begin to worship Jesus. And what naturally happens is that you desire to serve. I mean, it just goes hand in hand. That's why sermons on service are not that effective because it's not service that's the problem. It's worship. That's the problem. I tell every couple, when I do marriage counseling, I tell every couple that I sit with that they don't have a marriage problem, they have a discipleship problem. And a lot of times that really bums the couple out because they're hoping I have five or six tips that will help them communicate better. And I'm like, have you talked to my wife? I am clueless about how to communicate. Because it's not been our communication that has kept our marriage together and good sometimes. It's Jesus. Because marriage is a discipleship issue. Say amen. That was free. I wasn't even planning on saying that. I just threw that out there. So there you go. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> but when people worship, they serve. Can I share with you another passage that just kind of blew me away? never, ever thought about this. This is so exciting. And I, I, I see that seven of you share the excitement. I appreciate it. My mom's here. <laughs> no. When people worship, they cannot help but serve. Let me take you to Acts chapter 11. You don't have to turn there if you just want to listen. They might have it up there. Um, Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse uh, 25. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Everybody know who Saul is? His name would eventually be changed to Paul, right? So the Bible says, so Barnabas, where was I? 25, what chapter? Okay, I'm there. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. Why did he go look for him? Anybody know? Anybody know your Bible? Why did he go look for him? Because he just got converted. Remember the whole Damascus Road experience and he gets blinded? And so here's this newly converted Saul. He doesn't have a clue what to do. And Barnabas, you may know his nickname, the son of encouragement, goes to get this newly converted Saul to disciple him. That's why I love the picture, Wayne, in the baptistry of a young lady being discipled by another young lady. All of us need somebody in our life. And ain't none of you here spiritual enough that you don't need somebody pouring into your life spiritually. Every one of us need that, right? So Barnabas goes and he gets Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days, all right, this, this is going to blow you away. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and who? Saul. 
So Saul gets converted. And before he becomes Paul, he hears of a need. And what does he instinctively do? He wants to serve. What happened first for Saul? His worship changed. And then he served. I never, I never realized that. That it was Saul who began the collection. You remember all the missionary journeys Paul went on? And all along the way he's taken up a collection. Because a prophet of God said a famine's coming. And, and because of his conversion, because of his relationship with Jesus, he has a compassion for those people. Now listen, not just a compassion that they be fed. Because that was never Paul's driver. But he had a compassion that people would be saved. And hungry people typically don't experience conversion. You know why? Because they're hungry. How many times do we see Jesus before he teaches, what does he do? He fed the people. Why? So they would listen, right? And so when you worship, it totally affects that you are going to serve. So some of you that couldn't answer either the questions, would you go into the mine? Would you hold the rope? Maybe you're struggling with that question because your worship isn't right. Maybe that that's the problem, right? Here's the third final thing. God uses missions to open the eyes of those who cannot see. God does that. It's a powerful thing, right? And so missions exist because worship doesn't. I, I want to apologize to you. Steve's apologized a few times. People have asked, man, do we even do anything here for outreach, for missions? And you know what the answer is? Yes, we do a lot. But you know what we've been horrible at? Two things. One is just communicating what all happens here. We've been horrible at that, right? Honestly, we've been so bad at it that the vast majority of people that come here to church don't even know what all's going on. You know what the second thing we're horrible at? Is providing opportunities for everybody to be a part. That's going to change this year. So if at the end of 2019, you haven't found a way to get into a mine or hold a rope, it's going to be on you. Because the opportunities are going to be abundant. Next week, next Sunday, you're going to be presented with a lot of things that are going to be going on. Not just so that you will know, but so that you will be a part. Here's where we sold ourselves short. Every church has got 30 people that will do anything you ask. Every church. I don't care how big, how small. Every church has got 30 people that will do whatever you ask. And you, you know what, what trap a lot of churches fall into? You just ask those 30 because they'll get it done. Less work on my part because you just make that call and next thing you know, things are taken care of. But we've been poor shepherds that way. And that's going to change this year. Next Sunday, when you leave, that atrium is going to be filled with possibilities for you to go into the mine or to hold the rope. Okay? Okay? More on that next week. Let me close with this. In 1998, I remember the year because my son was one year old, right? And we just bought a new big rug in our living room. I remember those two things. I love that rug. <laughs> and I remember sitting there. Guess where I was sitting? <laughs> in my chair because I love it. And I get a call from a guy. And so me and a group of guys, I, this, this is not... Please don't laugh at what I'm about to say. Okay, it's not meant to be funny. But me and a group of guys played volleyball. We were the state champions three years in a row when I was in college. All right? We were awesome, basically. And a couple years after college, or I guess four years after college, one of those guys called and said, man, we've got an opportunity to go to Kazakhstan on a mission trip and share the gospel. And he said this, missionaries are not allowed there. So we're going to go as a volleyball team. And have opportunities to share the gospel. And I remember as he was saying that, Sam was one. I've got a new rug, which is really exciting. 
And I asked the guy, I said, will it be safe? And you know what I expected the answer to be. Oh, yeah. He said, man, I can't tell you that. There's been some issues there. I was like, really? I mean, what, what <laughs> kind of issues? <laughs> Long story short, I go. When we get there, we're going through customs, and I'm the last guy in line. Why am I the last guy in line? I don't know, but it seems like it always works out that way. I'm the last guy. Every guy on the team went through customs without be, even being asked a question. And I get there, and the lady says, business or pleasure? And I look to the team captain and the team, and they're walking, they're halfway down whatever the thing is. And I'm back there. And then she says, business or pleasure? And I'm just thinking, I'm a secret undercover missionary. You know, I mean, that's like all I can think of. <laughs> and then I give her, any volleyball people in the house? Then I give her the universal sign for volleyball. <laughs> that's why, right? <laughs> the missionary every day, he would tell us, Keith, you can come. Because if you're playing, I'll go faster. <laughs> Keith's like, no, you won't. <laughs> Every day the missionary would say to us, they're probably going to throw you guys out of the country today. And after three or four days, it just made me mad when he would say it. I don't know why. And he said it one day, and I just looked at him and said, okay, Dan, why don't they just kill us? He said, well, I mean, I guess they could do that too. That afternoon, these guards came up to us holding M16s. And they wanted our passports. Anybody ever travel abroad? What's the one rule? You don't give up your passport. So they asked for the passport. And me, trying to take lead of the team, I just looked at the guy and said, no, no, we don't know. And he held up the machine gun right to my head. Do you know what you do with no training and no teaching when there's a machine gun at your head? You give them whatever they want. Oh, all this. Yeah, here. <laughs> Enjoy. All that time, I was struggling all week long. Columbine had happened. Remember Columbine, the school shooting? Remember the story of Cassie Bernal, the girl that, that the shooter asked her, do you believe in Jesus? And she said yes, and they killed her. So because of that, what was swirling in my head all week was, would I be willing to die for Jesus? Right? What's the question I asked you at the beginning of the sermon? What would you give your life to? And I'm struggling all week. Would I be willing to die for Jesus? And I struggled all week to answer that question. And the whole trip culminates in this one night. Imagine right here is a door. Okay? So you come in the room right here. My bed was here. My college roommate's bed was here. There was another guy whose bed was there. A window. And in this corner was the missionary. So one night I awake to the most horrific screaming I've ever heard in my life. I can still hear it today. And I recognize the screaming as the voice of the missionary. And I'll never forget it, you all. It was, I was petrified. Matter of fact, I was turned facing the wall. I couldn't move. Have you ever been that scared? I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. And I'll never forget the missionary screaming as loud as he could. Go ahead, kill me! Kill me! Man, I'm just, everything in me is just shaking. And then the missionary says a line I'll never forget and have never heard since then. He yells, go ahead, cut my face off. And I thought, don't just shoot me. Don't cut my face off, right? And I'm scared to death. And it feels like this goes on for hours. And it was probably two or three minutes. And I finally kind of turn my head and I see my college roommate and his eyes are as big as mine and then we kind of look back and the missionary who at times the government took his children away from him who at times imprisoned him who, who at times beat him when you live life like that you have nightmares and he was having a nightmare so everybody gets out of the bed everybody's laughing even the missionary's laughing he's used to it Right? That that's how it is when your life is constantly under threat. 
And as soon as we all kind of got done just talking, I got into the bed as quick as I could, and I turned and I faced the wall, and I cried my eyes out because the question that I've been trying to answer all week long, would I die for Jesus? I knew the answer when that happened. You know what the answer was? No way. And Jesus taught me the most important lesson I've ever learned in my life, and that's this. If you are not willing to live for Jesus, you'll never have to worry about dying for him. And I realized that the great call is that Jesus came and died so that you and I would live. And so I don't want to guilt anybody into a mine. I don't want to guilt anybody into holding a rope because those are not things we have to do. They're things we are privileged to do because Jesus came and died for us. And in our struggle to answer the question, in our struggle to answer the question, maybe we're answering the wrong one. Because it's not about whether you're, you're sitting here and you're willing to die for Jesus. The question is, are you willing to live for him? Father, we come to you. And we thank you for the cross and the resurrection. Lord, we thank you for what you've done. Lord, that in your death, You've called us to live. And you've called us specifically to live for you. And so, Lord, next week we're going to talk about a lot of mines where people can go. We're going to talk about a lot of opportunities to hold the rope. Lord, we're going to talk about tackling the greatest mission that we've ever been given, and that's to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and forgive us, God, that we've loved our recliners more than we've loved you, that we've loved the ease and the pace and the comfort of our lives more than we've loved you. We love our schedule and our time more than we've loved you. And Jesus, my prayer isn't that you fill up the mines, that you put all kinds of hands on the ropes. That's not my prayer. My prayer is you would be the supreme object of our worship. Because if you are, are imminent, if you are, are supreme, all the other things fall into place. So have your way with us, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Let's stand together, church. This altar is open.